A very good morning and a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining in for today's webinar on a very special day, the National Science Day. Today, we'll be talking and discussing on a very interesting topic called physics in our neighborhood. And to talk more on this, we have a very special guest with us who probably need no introduction as students know him very well, Dr. Patrick Das Gupta from the Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi. About Patrick, sir, would like to share that after receiving the National Science Talent Search Scholarship in 1976, he joined Bits Pilani to do a five-year integrated MSc physics. In 1981, he took admission in PhD program at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, but left for Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. In 1982, as a research scholar in the theoretical astrophysics group, there he did his PhD with Professor Jayant V. Narlikar. During that period, he also collaborated with late Professor Geoffrey Burbridge, USA. Soon after submitting his PhD thesis in 1988, he joined Ayuka Pune as a postdoctoral fellow. During 1989 to 90, he had a short period at the University of Wales, Cardiff, UK, as a senior research fellow to learn about the gravitational wave data analysis technique. He joined the Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi in 1993. His current research interest includes studies related to confirmation of a Hawking area theorem from the observed gravitational wave from binary black holes, proposing a unified model for gamma ray burst and fast radio burst modeling dark energy. Currently, he is the elected president of Indian Association of General Relativity and Gravitation. He is also associate editor of Resonance and Indian Academy of Science General for undergraduate science topics. He has also been active in training and leading students for the International Physics Olympiad under the aegis of Homi Baba Center for Science Education, TIRF Mumbai. It's our privilege to host you, sir, at the planetarium. Thank you for giving the precious time. Thank Over you. To Thank you. you very much, madam, um, for inviting me to give this talk on this prestigious National Science Day. So I will start sharing my slides. Are you able to see the slides? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, can see that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, I would like to tell uh, students that uh, probably due to some technical glitch, we cannot see uh, Professor Patrick Das Gupta on screen, but I think you all can hear him loud and clear and his presentation is coming on the screen. You also can see that if you can just mention us in the chat box that everything is uh, clear, aud audible, and also you can see it visually. So we can begin the slideshow. So yes, I hope can... my slides are yeah, it's coming on the screen. In the full screen mode. Great. Yeah, it's coming on the full screen mode. Right. So we all know that physics and laws of physics govern the entire evolution of not only Earth solar system but the entire universe. But today we will talk about the day-to-day application of physical laws in our neighborhood. I dedicate this talk to late Dr. Ratnashri, who was the former director of the Nehru Planetarium, New Delhi, and who sadly is no more with us because of COVID. She passed away last year in the month of May. Now, let's begin with the definition of science itself. So when you ask what exactly is the origin of science, we all know that from our ancestors' time, we have been observing patterns and changes that happen in a secular manner cause and effect relations in our day-to-day -day lives that 
the phenomena take place in nature and the entire subject of science grew over several hundreds of years to make sense of all these pattern the cause and effect relations and to understand various phenomena using a small number of mathematical laws which are sometimes they are called postulates sometimes called laws etc and using this small sets of laws one predicts new phenomena and if these new phenomena that are predicted happen to be seen in various scientific experiments or various natural uh, observations then we know that our existing set of laws or postulates they are a good scientific description of natural phenomena so our ancestors for instance saw this systematic pattern of stars as the day evolves to night night crosses various phases and finally the day breaks out our ancestors figured out that stars all go around a particular fixed stars so at present that fixed star is the pole star or dhruva tara and our ancestors therefore placed special emphasis to locating the dhruva tara or the pole star because navigation how to determine which is north which is east which is west which is south dependent on the position of stars uh, for our ancestors because they did not have a proper compass or any other gyroscopic means of finding directions so they essentially uh, found out the directions for the purpose of navigation using the position of stars and that's the reason the pole star was very important for our ancestors similarly uh, when you go to a sea resort you see the waves coming in a very systematic and regular manner there are times when there is high tide there are times when there are low tide and soon ancestors realized that high tide and low tide phenomena they depend on the positions of sun as well as moon similarly uh, our civilization all human civilization is based on agriculture taking a very important role in human lives and agriculture uh, essentially started when our ancestors realized that inert seeds when they are planted in fertile soil uh, they evolve there is a break and roots develop out of the seed the roots take firm foundation in the soil and then a shoot comes off and starts growing in the upward direction and soon leaves emerge and so on so biological science developed in this regular systematic um, phenomena of germination of plants similarly how eggs hatch and give rise to uh, baby birds and so on and so forth so essential thing to realize is the discipline of science is a systematic observation of natural phenomena all around us and try to understand the natural happenings in a very very definite and quantitative manner and because of which mathematics comes in as 
a very, very important tool in modeling the laws that describe the natural happenings or natural phenomena. So, for instance, because today is the National Science Day and it is on 28th February uh, that C. V. Raman, the first Indian uh, Nobel laureate in science, he on 28th February along with his student K. S. Krishnan, they discovered a special class of scattering which is today referred to as Raman scattering for which C. V. Raman was awarded the Nobel Prize. But before we go to Raman scattering, let's go and look at why sky is blue. All right. So we know that during the daytime, sky is blue, while when the sun is rising in the east, the sun appears reddish orange, uh, while as it goes up towards the zenith, it appears yellowish white. And Raleigh scattering, Raleigh was the physicist who realized the reason why the sky is blue um, and why when the sun, when it is rising or setting, when it is very close to the horizon, it appears, appears reddish orange. And he understood that it is a scattering of electromagnetic waves that emanates from the sun and because the scattering takes place uh, due to the atoms in the atmosphere of earth and atoms have typically a size of one angstrom which is about 10 to the power minus 8 centimeters and therefore the high frequency radiation that means the wavelength being shorter uh, and comparable to the dimension of the atoms, they get scattered uh, more often than long wavelength radiation like uh, red wave electromagnetic light or uh, orangish light and so on. And because of that, the sky appears blue. Why? Because uh, the blue part of the sky is atoms are high up from compared to the horizon and the light which strikes an atom uh, because it gets scattered more and it is the high frequency part of the light that scatters more often. That's the reason why the sky part uh, is blue while when the sun is uh, near the horizon, the light from the sun traverses a greater atmospheric length and since high frequency part gets scattered more therefore what is remaining is the uh, low frequency or long wavelength which is red and orange and that's the reason why sun when it, when it is uh, near the horizon it appears reddish orange in color so this is a much more uh, elaborate diagram describing why the sun when it is overhead it appears appears yellowish white while when it is near the horizon the observer being here the amount of distance that rays have to go through the atmosphere is long for example when the sun is at the horizon the distance traveled through the atmosphere is only this much, while when it is at the um, horizon, the distance traveled is much larger. And that's the reason blue part getting scattered more often than the uh, red part. Red Only the red light, which is not scattered much, directly comes to the observer and the sun appears reddish orange, while uh, when it is in the zenith, it the distance being shorter through the atmosphere, the sun appears yellowish white. When Raman for the first time 
traveled to west, he realized that the ocean water is much bluer than the ocean water that he typically saw in Chennai. Those days it was Madras. And he wondered why. The earlier theory, which was due to Raleigh, as to what determines the ocean color was that it was purely due to the water in the ocean reflecting the sky color. So before Raman ventured into this arena, it was accepted by physicists that the ocean color is purely uh, governed by the sky color because it is the sky color which gets reflected by the ocean and that's the reason if the sky is blue, the water of the ocean appears blue and when the sky is grey, the water appears grey. While there is some part of this model correct, but not in its entirety and this Raman had realized immediately. For example, he realized that although it is true that when the sky is overcast, when the sky is uh, cloudy and there is uh, the not much of uh, solar radiation is striking the uh, oceanic water, then ocean does appear grey. But it can happen that the sky is not overcast, that means the sky is not cloudy and yet the water may not appear blue. For example, in this picture, you can see this part of the water appears uh, greenish while this part appears uh, deep blue in color. And Raman got deep into this aspect and he realized, again, to a large extent, the color of ocean is again determined by the scattering because the green part is mainly there are planktons and weeds, etc., which scatter and the part because the portion of the ocean which is closer to the shore, the depth of the ocean is not very large and those parts is the plankton and the seaweed that scatter the light and that's the reason why this part of the ocean appears somewhat greenish while the deeper parts they appear blue because there is also the water molecules also scatter the light uh, and so it is not purely reflection, but the scattering also to a large extent determine the color of the ocean. Right. Then, of course, Raman and K.S. Krishnan discovered the so-called Raman effect, which is uh, much more bizarre. And uh, essentially, the observation was purely due to scattering from certain kind of uh, uh, molecules, you could, the wavelength of the light can be longer after scattering as well as it can be shorter after scattering. And the last part that even after scattering, the wavelength can be shorter, that means frequency can be higher, was counterintuitive. But the Raman effect was observed and we know the explanation is due to molecules being in a higher state and after scattering, when they come down to the lower state, the radiation that we see, even though there is no absorption or um, absorption or emission after absorption, it's, although it's very it's scattering, because the molecular states was in a higher energy state and after scattering, they have come down to a lower state, the scattered light uh, has a higher frequency or a shorter wavelength. And this counter counterintuitive uh, scattering, which today is referred to as Raman scattering, plays a very, very important tool in uh, many, many um, uh, investigations of uh, structures of molecule and um, uh, the material science nanotechnology, uh, they 
very frequently use this Raman spectroscopy technique. Right. So, uh, as I said, that science is based on a particular systematic method called scientific method, where you do controlled experiment or, in other words, systematic observation and try to understand the pattern by using a model. The model is normally termed as hypothesis to a large extent to begin with the hypothesis is a tentative body of uh, laws which is made to explain whatever has been observed but how do you know that this hypothesis or the body of laws that a scientist has proposed is a good body of knowledge so that is done by the following that this hypothesis predicts a new phenomena emerging logically out of this model and if this new phenomena is corroborated by good experimentation and by good ob observation then you know that this body of uh, knowledge or hypothesis is corroborated otherwise you have to revise your hypothesis and this chain goes on and if you have a body of knowledge whose all predictions have been um, observed, then that occupies a very, very uh, confirmed status of theory, like special theory of relativity or general theory of relativity and so on. Now, you might wonder that what is the first set of mathematical laws that ever came in uh, and you'll be surprised the first set of mathematical laws that was proposed was by Kepler who based on very good measurement of positions of planets with respect to sun uh, Kepler gave his three laws which is taught often uh, for our BSc uh, students and Kepler gave the first set of mathematical laws in which he said sun is at one of the foci of an ellipse and a planet traces out an elliptical orbit and in equal time uh, the uh, radial vector from sun to the planet it sweeps out in equal time equal areas and the third law being, being the period, that is the time period taken by a planet to complete one full orbit, that square of the period is proportional, this should not be equal but proportional to cube of the semi-major axis, that is from the focus to the uh, largest point on the turning point of the uh, ellipse. Now, of course, although these were good mathematical laws for the solar system, but Kepler's laws did not tell why, after all, this is happening. And that was later on described more fundamentally by Newton when he gave a good mathematical modeling of the force of gravity. And before I come to Newton's laws of gravity, one of the pioneering things that was done uh, was by Galileo. Uh, before Galileo, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, he had given cert certain rudimentary observation because he had observed that leaves, when they dry leaves, when they fall from the tree, they take a longer time to land on the ground while when you drop stones from the same height they land on the ground much faster. So that led Aristotle to make a tentative tentative hypothesis, hypothesis that heavier objects fall to the ground faster than lighter objects. Galileo had spotted a logical fallacy in Aristotelian 
um, uh, theory of falling of bodies. And what was that? That suppose heavier bodies indeed fall faster uh, compared to lighter bodies. What you do is take two bodies, one heavier than the other, and connect, tie them up with a piece of wire. Then, of course, now the combined weight is much bigger than individual weight because now the heavier body is connected to the lighter body. So the total weight is much bigger. So according to Aristotle, the full object, the heavier body connected to light object must fall faster than either the heavier body or the lighter object. All right. But the point is, if you drop both of them, then the heavier body tries to fall faster while lighter body tries to fall slower. So therefore, heavier body gets dragged up, dragged upwards by the lighter body and therefore the combined object should be falling slower than the heavier body itself. So therefore, there was a logical flaw in Aristotle's um, law and therefore Galileo decided that, you know, logic is fine, but the best way to figure out whether something is right or wrong is to actually perform a good experiment. So the legend goes that he went up to the top of the leaning tower of Pisa. He had two cannonballs, one a heavier cannonball, the other lighter, and he dropped them at the same time and showed that both of them landed at the ground at the same time. So after this was established, Newton, he realized that the Kepler's three laws can be explained by giving a proper law for the force of gravity. And incidentally, he deduced the force of force law of gravity, the inverse square law of gravity, by realizing, and that is the leap of imagination he used, he deduced that an object like an apple from the tree falling to the ground with an acceleration of 9.8 meter per second square and moon going around the earth, after all, moon going around the earth, meaning that you moon was having a centripetal acceleration. So he realized the centripetal acceleration is also pointed uh, exactly towards the center of the earth, like a falling apple when it accelerated downwards. It's also pointing, the acceleration is pointing towards the center of the earth. Newton realized that going around of moon is nothing but moon is also falling towards the earth. And because Newton could deduce the distance of moon to earth, and since the period of moon going around earth is about 28 days, so he immediately calculated the centripetal acceleration, and the centripetal acceleration was 0 0.0027 meter per second square, much less than 9.8 meter per second square, the acceleration of a typical object near the surface of the earth, and realize this could be due to the high distance of the moon compared to an apple in a tree. And that's how he deduced that gravity goes down, the force goes down inversely to the square of the distance of the object. And Einstein, he used the Galilean principle that objects fall at the same acceleration rate. That means no matter what mass the object has, the acceleration in a given gravitational field is identical. New Einstein explained Newtonian gravity from the standpoint of geometry. I will not elaborate on this, but all I will say is that Einstein, based on Galilean experiment, realized that if indeed all objects 
fall with the same acceleration, then if I take an observer in a frame of reference that is freely falling, then since all objects are accelerating identically in that frame, for an observer in that frame, there is no gravity. And this particular thought later on Einstein said was uh, when he realized that it was the happiest day of his life. And the entire general theory of relativity, which says that gravity is not a force, but manifestation of the geometry of the space time is based on this idea that no matter how strong is the gravity, no matter how non-uniform is the gravity, no matter how time dependent is the gravity, in any situation, you can always have a sufficiently uh, small size of frame of reference, which when it freely falls for a small enough time duration, inside that frame, gravity will disappear. So entire general relativity is based on this physical premise, which is called the Einsteinian, Einsteinian, uh, Einsteinian principle of equivalence. Uh, I will not go into details into this, but all I will tell you is this general theory of relativity and special theory of relativity is actually being used in our day-to-day -day life. You might ask where? As you know, nowadays, uh, when you drive a car, you use the uh, GPS mode to arrive at your location and GPS, the so-called global position system of satellites, they uh, use a particular technique. Suppose uh, there's this point on Earth or this point on Earth, they figure out the location by finding out the distance. And how do they find the distance? From this, suppose your car is here, it is constantly sending signal. So various satellites, which are part of the GPS system, they receive light and the time at which the signal is being sent and the time at which they receive the light, from that they know these distances. Okay. And therefore, the location can be pinpointed exactly because this distance meaning that you know where the signal is coming from, from the time delays, you know the signal is coming from a particular distance. So you know the location for a given satellite knows the given position can be anywhere on the sphere. Another satellite similarly finds out the sphere from where the signal would be coming and similarly another satellite and so on. And because it is the same source, the common intersecting point of all these spheres finally gives you the position. And this system of triangulation uh, is how you your GPS system locates an object. But because it is based on time delays, therefore, the clocks here on Earth and the clocks on the satellite must be synchronized. But clocks on the satellite, they go, they have a different ticking rate because they are moving and general relativity tells you that clocks in stronger gravity go slower, but because they are far away from Earth, the ticking rate is faster compared to the clock that is ticking on the surface of the Earth because it's in stronger gravity. And also the satellites are moving. So you have to make both special relativistic correction as well as general relativistic correction so that these clocks remain synchronized so that through time delays, you exactly measure these distances. And by triangulation, you figure out the location. So in other words, what I am trying to imply is that today's GPS system is actually utilizing both special and general relativistic corrections in the ticking of clocks. Let me skip this. This is just telling you that uh, general relativity also predicts gravitational lensing uh, and also it predicts 
uh, gravitational waves, black holes, and so on. Let me go to other very day-to-day -to -day physics uh, that is again and again used in our uh, mundane daily lives. We all study the Ohm's law, which tells us that if you take any piece of uh, conductor, which basically is, has a resistance, so a conductor has a resistance R, let's say, and you connect it with a battery, which can generate a voltage difference V, then the current that flows uh, through the circuit is given by the Ohm's law, which is current is voltage divided by the resistance. In other words, given a fixed voltage, if the resistance is more, then the current that flows is less and vice versa. So here is a cartoon as to uh, resistance tries to strangulate the current. More the resistance, more is the strangulation and uh, harder is for the current to flow. This is a cartoon. I mean, don't have to take it seriously. Uh, and we also know the microscopic theory as to why there is uh, resistance and why is it that you require a potential difference to maintain a steady current. Normally, if you take a piece of conductor, in a conductor like a metal, there is a sea of free electrons, which because ions, here the brownish orangish color objects are positively charged ions, and the blue colors are the electrons, and they are lighter. And the sea of electrons, electrons being lighter, they have greater mobility. But normally when they constitute a current, that means they are moving, drifting in a given direction. Uh, the reason why you still require a potential difference is there are this lattice vibration and this lattice vibration, they keep on scattering the electrons in different direction. So in other words, the current requires the electrons to move in a steady manner in one direction so that they constitute a current while the resistance that are essentially due to lattice vibration, the at any given temperature, the ions are randomly moving and thereby creating random vibration. It is this random vibration which deflect the electrons. So the electrons, uh, without a given voltage difference, they would get scattered helter-skelter and therefore there won't be a steady current. Because after all, current is flow of charged particles in a definite man. And in the case of insulator, uh, such steady current is not possible even when you apply it with voltage uh, because in a conductor like metal, there is a sea of free electrons. Insulators don't have free electrons. And uh, early on, people had noticed that uh, particularly in cold weather countries where due to low temperature, the atmosphere becomes very dry because uh, whatever humidity was there in the air, if the temperature comes down, the water would simply turn in, the vapor would turn into liquid water and get deposited. So the air becomes very dry. And in such uh, dry uh, place, if you uh, rub anything, your hands or clothes, the static charges develop. And uh, so if, for example, you uh, rub your thumb against something and the thumb becomes uh, positively charged, then the electron, the air being drier, electron can easily, when you bring your finger, thumb and the finger close by, then the electron can go towards the positively charged thumb and you uh, see a spark. And uh, uh, similarly, in cold weather, because of hair getting charged and static uh, charges, when you rub against a seat, they get they can get oppositely charged, and you see the hair standing out. So negatively charged hair gets attracted to positive charged seats, and so on, and all kinds of funny things due to 
such static electricity happens in the cold countries. And we, of course, know that same sparking is essentially uh, when you take, when you connect uh, two pieces of wire to the electrical supply and you try to bring the two ends, you see uh, very bright sparks because from one end the electrons hop onto the other end because electrons get attracted to the positive uh, charges out here. And the day-to-day -day phenomena of lightning that we observe is essentially the same phenomena. It so happens that uh, because of winds, turbulence, and so on, the uh, there is a potential gradient uh, where the Earth is at a much lower potential. That means the atmospheric charges are uh, relative to Earth's surface is positively charged uh, and therefore when the lightning happens, the clouds are so much more positively charged that, that you know, the, uh, there is a flow of electron. If the Earth or the tree gets positively charged, the electrons flow in this direction while if the uh, Earth has develops negative charge, the electrons flow from the Earth towards skyward and so on. And the, when the electrons move within this potential difference, they get accelerated and high energy electrons going through the atmosphere, they knock off the electrons and therefore when the electrons combine with the atoms, they produce this electric discharge, the light, and that's what we call lightning and so on. So for these natural phenomena, it's the electricity uh, and magnetism which describe most of the natural phenomena. The other thing that is associated with uh, current carrying conductors is that we all know that if you have a conductor and if current flows in this direction, then in a straight conductor, when current flows in this direction, the convention normally is if I say the current is flowing in this direction, that means electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. Then magnetic field is generated and the magnetic lines of forces have this kind of a orientation, the so-called uh, right-hand rule. Uh, so if the current flows in this direction, point your thumb towards this, curl up your fingers, the magnetic field lines are the, in the direction your hands are uh, curling. Uh, but remember that when I say current is flowing in this direction, it means electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. And the magnetic field, this current developing magnetic field or the magnets themselves having an influence on the current, they have been traditionally used in the case of compass needle. Compass, for example, you know that uh, compass needles, they can get deflected if you take a carrying, current carrying conductor and go near a compass needle, the compass needle gets deflected because the current carrying conductor generates a magnetic field and this magnetic field has a force on the compass needle because the compass needle is basically a magnet with north pole at one point, south pole at other point and compass needle they have been used uh, to find out the direction because the earth's northern geographic pole very close to it the magnetic south pole is there and the geographic south pole very close to it the magnetic north pole is there because earth there are all kinds of plasma currents swirling around at its hot molten core because of which earth is also like a magnet and therefore when you take a compass needle the north of the compass compass needle points towards geographic north because very close to the geographic north you have the earth's magnetic south pole and so on so magnetic field plays a very very important role because all your 
generators, the dynamo generators, the way they generate electricity is because of a law called Faraday's law, which says that if you change the magnetic flux, then it creates a potential difference or the so-called electromagnetic force, EMF. And the way you generate electricity in a generator or a dynamo is you take uh, a coil and the coil uh, sweeps through magnetic field so that the magnetic flux through the coil changes with time. And Faraday's law says that the EMF developed is nothing but if you have n windings, not just one loop, but n windings, then n times the rate of change of magnetic flux through one of the coil uh, is the EMF generated. That means more the number of windings of a coil, uh, more is the EMF. And that's the basic principle used in your generator, in your day-to-day -day life generator to develop electricity. While the motor works in a different way, the motor that when you switch on your fan, for example, uh, your, the way, the reason why fan rotates is because there's a motor in the fan, uh, which is the reverse of the generator, because you can show that if you bring a magnet, the, I gave you the example of compass near the uh, wire carrying current, you can show that the magnet if it is brought near current, it can, uh, uh, the magnet gets deflected. In other words, in a motor, what happens is you have a permanent magnet and you have a coil. And when you pass current, the magnet exerts force on the coil and the coil turns. And that's the principle of motor, which has been traditionally used in various day-to-day -day device, in particular, your electric fan that you use in your room in on hot days but the bizarre thing is that there are materials called superconductors which behave in a very funny way in normal ordinary conductor when you place it near a bar magnet for example the magnetic field passes through ordinary correct conductor but there are certain conductors which are called superconductor these objects when you cool below a particular temperature the resistance in the substance goes go to zero and such superconductors when there is not only the resistance goes to zero they become diamagnets they become perfect diamagnets because because they don't let any magnetic field go through them that means they ripple magnetic field and you might have seen some experiments uh, shown to you where uh, you have a normal uh, matter which is not a superconductor and a piece of bar magnet rests on it and when you pour liquid nitrogen on this uh, matter this matter turns into a superconductor the moment it turns into superconductor the magnet just goes up and floats on it because now this object has become a perfect diamagnet it ripples magnetic field and therefore the bar magnet gets rippled and gravity is pulling down the bar magnet while the repulsion due to the superconductor keeps the magnet afloat. So in the case of uh, superconductor, when you cool below a particular temperature, resistance simply drops to zero and the so-called Meissner effect, the magnetic field gets repulsed. And so here is a better picture of how the magnetic field gets repulsed when you turn this object into a superconductor. And one way to understand this is as to why a superconductor uh, repels a magnetic field is uh, because the superconductor has zero resistance. So when you turn on the magnetic field due to Lenz's law, current develops to oppose the magnetic field. And because there's no resistance, the current keeps going on and the, the direction of the current is such as to oppose the magnetic field. This is a intuitive way of explaining the Meissner effect, but this is not the uh, whole thing. The real answer lies 
in the quantum theory uh, that really it's a macroscopic quantum uh, aspect of a superconductor that explains as to why the resistance goes to zero and why you get this Meissner effect in which magnetic field lines are um, uh, sort of pushed out of the superconductor. The other bizarre phenomena I don't want to go in because I want to cover uh, different uh, aspects like Josephson effect where you take two superconductor and uh, you put a, a thin sandwich of insulator and you can show that even when you don't apply any battery, if you just connect such a uh, object where you have two superconductors separated by a thin slice of insulator, current starts flowing. And superconductors and superfluids, they have all kinds of bizarre phenomena. The other day-to-day -day thing, which is often you actually uh, use without realizing that uh, it is the quantum photoelectric effect which is being used, uh, you know that very often when you go uh, through a particular uh, door, uh, then uh, automatically uh, there is a counter which registers that someone has gone through the door and this very often uses the photoelectricity. As you know, around 1904 or so, uh, photoelectricity was discovered in which it was seen that when light falls on certain metals, the light photons, they eject out electrons and therefore light falling on metals can start a current and it is these which are used in your uh, uh, doors when that detect when someone goes by you immediately know someone across the door because there's a light uh, going across the entrance and when someone goes through for a while uh, the person obstructs the light and therefore there is no current and that's how you detect that someone has gone through the door and it is used in many security when you pass through a security check these are the effects which are used and uh, there are many other things like uncertainty principle which are also used in the case of um, uh, the uh, tunneling uh, microscope and uh, so on. I don't want to go into it because I want to give more examples of physics which are in your day-to-day -day life. For example, refrigerator. Refrigerator is a, a common uh, device in uh, many households and uh, you might ask how does a refrigerator keeps uh, objects inside namely food inside uh, at a much colder temperature uh, in hot weather uh, uh, the way you uh, explain it is that that you have some coolant fluid like freon 12 uh, which goes around and keeps it cool but you might ask how do you maintain such uh, cold fluid? And it is again done uh, through physical laws, like suddenly you expand a gaseous system and you have a jar of gas and you suddenly expand, then the gas inside gets cooled. The reason is that when you have a gas uh, in the cylinder, then the normal temperature is due to the random motion of gaseous atoms and molecules. So when you suddenly let it expand, the gaseous molecules do work um, uh, to expand. And therefore, because they are doing work, therefore their random energy uh, decreases because their kinetic energy has been used up in uh, doing the work and thereby they cool down. You further cool down by again compressing it fast because there is a motor running in the refrigerator. When you suddenly compress, then the, the, all the internal energy is low, but it gets heated up because when you suddenly compress, there is uh, Charles' law, which says that when you compress, the temperature goes up. And so it gets heated up. Already the internal energy was low, but now it has got heated up. You take away the heat uh, by a coolant, then 
remaining and you again expand, you further cool the cool down. So in this process of thermodynamic cycles, you cool it to such a uh, high level that you can keep food material in the fridge at a much lower temperature. So these are all day-to-day uh, -day phenomena where laws of various fields of physics, their laws are used. Uh, I think I have, uh, I, I can go on, but what I would like to do is instead, I would want more interaction. Let the uh, students ask me questions about what they see in their neighborhood and what physical explanation can one provide. So I, I think I should stop. And instead, I would rather um, have as many questions from the students so that we have a fruitful discussion on um, physics that we encounter in our day-to-day -day life. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Patrick Das Gupta, for uh, such uh, great presentation, uh, which covers That's almost right. each and every nitty gritty physics around us. And uh, the day will not be complete uh, if we not take the name of Dr. N. Ratna Shri, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation uh, at during the start as well, because Planetarium has many, many, many found memories, and especially uh, when these days comes, like National Science Day or uh, some uh, eclipse or something. So we have really very, very fond memories with Ratna Shri ma'am and myself personally on National Science Day and on a teacher's day, I used to give a handwritten note on her table just to uh, give my, my side of a gratitude and a thank you for always inspiring me in these things. Thank, thank you, so, thank you very much. So uh, it's a huge loss and on certain day, we, we always miss uh, Ratna Shri ma'am on, on these special day we certainly miss her more. So we really wish that where, wherever she is, she'll be happy soul and always giving her blessing to all the lovely students. Thank you, thank you, right, thank you. So uh, now we'll uh, open the discussion and uh, students can mention whatever uh, coming to their mind, as sir told that what you have observed, physics in your day-to-day -day life or around your neighborhood, you can mention that, please don't hesitate that maybe your question sounds silly or wrong. Please don't hesitate about no, that. No, I just say that there are no silly questions. Yes. All yes. questions are good and important. Yes. So generally students hesitate in uh, initial time and then gradually they become familiar by asking them. So please come forward. Please mention your question in the chat box. I'll be uh, highlighting those so that uh, they'll be coming on the screen and uh, Patrick sir can take those. We have one, uh, I think uh, Chandri, I'm, I'm taking their screen names. Sorry if uh, these names are correct or not, but I'm taking their screen name. Come Chandrika. Yeah, so I can see the uh, question from uh, Chandrika who is asking, will the deep sea also have the same blue color? So it depends upon the depth. If you go very deep, as you know, that when you go deep into the water, the amount of radiation gets depleted because uh, the light keeps on getting scattered. So when you go to great depths, you will find the intensity of solar radiation is very low. So very deep inside the ocean, it is absolutely dark. So you need special kind of torches uh, when you go for deep sea um, scuba diving, then you need to have uh, artificial light because at great depths, the oceans are dark. So Chandrika, hope you got uh, the clarification. And uh, if any anything you would like to add on, like you have observed or would like to uh, comment on uh, any part during the presentation, as well as in your day-to-day -day life, you have observed something, you can also post in the chat box and we can have a discussion on that.
So note that, uh, you know, you can raise any question. Remember, only by asking question that you learn about nature. Because we know that if I want to know your name, I have to ask you. Similarly, if you want to learn about nature, there are ways of asking questions, either perform experiment or you uh, try to quantitatively reason out, logically deduce something. So, therefore, it is very important to be curious and to ask questions. And I would say that curiosity is a positive point and no question is silly. Yes, indeed. No, uh, I I think uh, we'll we'll wait for two three more minutes because then uh, this live will be so long to get upload on the YouTube. So I uh, humbly request if any doubt or anything you have, kindly post it fast. So else we'll wrap today's discussion because uh, then the video will take so much longer time to get upload on the YouTube. All right. I I think that no question means that uh, the things are clear and sorted in everybody's mind. And uh, uh, no questions coming in the chat room also prove that uh, you have received the presentation, the discussion uh, well in your mind. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Patrick Das Gupta for giving your precious time despite of uh, sitting in the very far away in the, another part of the country, another part of the uh, map. So you managed it, sir, and uh, giving your precious time to have this interaction on the Planetarium YouTube channel. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it is my pleasure. So thank you for having me, man, and take care. And uh, so these are, you know, tough times due to yes. uh, COVID and all. So take care, everyone. So good night. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Uh, take care, you too, as well. And uh, I think when things uh, get settled and everything and you'll be back in the country, we'll try to uh, fix some uh, session in the planetarium so that students can uh, have one-on-one -on -one interaction. I think that is the better medium to have uh, the better, better clarity on the topic or the subject. So we'll really hope uh, soon to see you at the planetarium. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And... Uh, Everyone do take good care of yourself. Thank you and a very happy National Science Day to everyone. May the science enlighten every one of us. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Take care, sir.